Welcome to The Mystic and the Skeptic, the show that asks the tough questions and explores different alternatives to today's pressing issues, theories, or enigmas. A podcast devoted to the exploration of all things mystical, philosophical, scientific, political, conspiratorial, and cosmic. Join us in an exploration of the mystic skeptic mind space. In this week's show, our guest is Leticia Manzano from the Houston Area Women's Center. Ms. Manzano um, is going to be sharing with us um, some of her knowledge about how trauma affects people. There's been a lot of things that have been shared in the media regarding uh, the different um, experiences people have had with powerful men who have attacked them. And sometimes it's hard to to process how can the, these things happen. So we want to have an open conversation about that. Um, Ms. Manzano, can you tell us a little bit about how you get involved in this type of work and how the Houston Area Women's Center helps people in these situations? Absolutely. So, again, my name is Leticia Manzano, and I work at an organization in Houston. We're um, known as the Women's Center, but we are the Houston Area Women's Center. And I grew up in Houston, and all the while that I was growing up, I was learning from my parents that... Per- that serving, like serving the community, serving at our church, for example, was very important. So when I grew up and went to college, I wanted to go into a field where I could provide service. And so I actually found jobs working with children, tutoring, teaching them how to read, uh, being a camp counselor in the summer. And so when I finally graduated Um, There was a position here at the Houston Area Women's Center working with children, doing children's counseling with uh, the children and teens who lived at our shelter, who were, um, had witnessed domestic violence and had to flee their homes. So that was how I got in the door. I actually worked with the children's program for seven years. And in that time, I learned a lot about working with adults, because obviously we um, work with the children, but we have to work with their parents and caregivers and guardians as well. So I worked, I also did work with uh, children and teens who had been sexually abused at some point during those seven years. And so then I got some experience doing leadership in the agency. I became a manager and I managed the entire uh, counseling and advocacy program. So children's counseling, adult counseling, outreach counseling, um, all of that for 10 years. And then finally, two years ago, I decided to go back to providing support to the client. So going back to direct service because it's what I like to do and there was an opening in our same program um, for the sexual assault services coordinator so now I work mainly with adult survivors of sexual violence so women who have experienced anywhere from um, sexual harassment to attempted rape to rape um, and women it can also be men of course Um, So people who have experienced childhood sexual abuse. And that's how I got into the work, and that's what I do now. I hope that answers the question. My first interview, like talking about this topic, we've done, we did one about human trafficking with an organization in Nashville. Sometimes we talk about conspiracy theories, sometimes we talk about politics, but I feel that none of the shows have actually dealt with like serious stuff that is affecting people like there was one about veterans but so i I wanted to be more real and more like focused on 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 things that that people need help on i don't know if you've been um purview to the the coverage of the harvey weinstein um accusations and um there's also before that during the presidential campaign there was accusations regarding the the current president um the question i have for you is um does the media, in your experience, um, and especially in, in, in the current um, affairs, uh, um, are they sensitive to the plight of survivors of sexual abuse, or do they sen- uh, sensationalize uh, these cases and, and kind of make it more difficult for, for people who have experienced this? Well, let me tell you that um, whenever there are headlines 
um, about any, well, you know, famous people in the U.S., including celebrities, we do, it does tend to become a topic in the support groups that I run um, or in individual counseling. So, and most of the, most of the feedback that I get is positive. Survivors want people to know about sexual assault. Survivors want people to get more education about what sexual harassment is, for example, with the last case that you mentioned. Um, survivors this time around wanted to know, wanted people to know why it's not easy to tell immediately, why it's not easy to, um, you know, tell the world this happened to me, feeling so alone in it all. But then finally, you know, one person speaking up and letting a whole lot of others come forward. So um, we also talk about the negatives to it. So how sometimes survivors are played out in the media, not played out in the media necessarily. I don't think that the media is responsible for it, but definitely the perpetrators wanting survivors to look crazy, to look like they don't know what they're talking about to look like liars by claiming that the the assaults were consensual um, and by people again also the survivors that I work with have said that they want people to understand the power that perpetrators hold and it's kind of kind of like a these events are kind of like a, a microcosm to what's happening in the lives of survivors that I work with who aren't necessarily famous people, um, that, that the perpetrator holds the power and that the myths around sexual assault, like the, the main one, which is the woman did something to cause it, the survivor did something to cause the abuse, is just that. It's a myth. It's never the victim's fault. So I think it's, it's been seen pretty positively. Um, I definitely don't think it's sensationalized when you have one, two, nine, fifteen people coming forward um, saying that it was the same person. The studies show that perpetrators perpetrate against many people before they're actually um, outed, if you will, or caught. Well, the the issue of sensationalizing it is um, gonna not being sensitive, like um, being very graphic or being very um, flippant about people's pain. Like I, I know in movies, uh, sometimes they depict a, a rape or they depict abuse and they, this is strange how, I don't know if they're trying to romanticize it or they're trying to make it artistic or something. So I wonder if there's, that people have been triggered or have been um, hurt by by seeing people talk about abuse as it's just like anything else, or like they'll they'll do a story on abuse and then they'll move on to the weather. Has any of your clients ever complained about um, them being kind of not sensitive to how it can re-traumatize them to even hear about what people are going through? Well, I definitely think that clients have reported feeling triggered and that's you know, a word that comes up often in, in sexual assault. Definitely when they see movies with graphic images. Um, and so there are survivors who have compiled lists of movies that um, to give other survivors a warning about. Like, you know, if you're going to watch this movie, just know that there's a graphic rape scene in it. There are counselors who report, you know, have reported to me, like there's a certain show on television that has a graphic rape scene that they will not watch because it's going to trigger them even though they may not necessarily have experienced sexual assault themselves but in working with clients they experience secondary trauma. I think everyone who does understand the reality of sexual assault um, gets angered when a survivor gets treated unfairly in the media um, or is portrayed as, you know, where, where, where his or her assault is minimized. I think there's lots of anger 
Um, but I don't think that that's necessarily, you know, a negative. Uh, anger is a, is a common emotion, uh, and there's usually other underlying emotions around it. It can also uh, move a, a person to take action in their, um, in their communities. And so I think when we're talking about news reports, it's different than talking about movies, for example. Um, I also think that the clients who are in counseling understand that the media is going to have two minutes to talk about this important topic. But even those two minutes is important to them because they want people to know what's happening. And I know we're talking about sexual assault, but I also want to mention that with domestic violence cases, one of the things that survivors report over and over is that when there is a story, um, for example, in Texas, it's mostly men who kill their, their wives or girlfriends. Like these are the reports that we get from the Texas Council on Family Violence. It's always women who die at the hands of their their ex-husband or, or estranged husband or current husband or boyfriend. And the survivors say, you know, the, the media puts on these, these stories, but they never say the words domestic violence or they never put your hotline on the stories. The Spanish-speaking media does, but the English-speaking media hasn't caught on yet and our survivors complain about that because they say had I known that that was domestic violence had I known the hotline number you know I would have come a long time ago so again I think survivors in general are grateful for the information getting out but it doesn't mean that the that media can't do a better job of it of course uh, for our audience, is there a difference between sexual assault and rape? Uh, in one of the reports, they talked about it like in in different contexts. Um, is is it like a legal definition that they're using, or are they synonyms? Um, in Texas, they're synonyms, and I think it's going to go uh, state to state to depend on how how. And I'm going to use rape just as the general term that's understood by society to mean, um, you know, a forced sexual pen penetration. So when people use the word rape, we have an image of it. We know what we're talking about. And when people say sexual assault, it sometimes gets confused by sexual harassment or some other things like that. And we can define those as well. But in Texas, when you look at the criminal code, it does say sexual assault. That's what the crime is called. But in another state, the crime could be called rape. And sexual assault can be, um, can be defined otherwise. So I think it's really important not to minimize the words sexual assault because a person may be talking about a rape. And conversely, it's important not to minimize any sexual violence. So here at the Women's Center, we've started using those words a lot. We say sexual violence because it can run a gamut. The clients that I see have experienced what we call complex trauma, which means that they've been traumatized more than once in their life. So, for example, I have a client who um, was sexually abused by her uncle, and then her grandfather when she was a child, and then when she was an adult, she was sexually assaulted by um, someone who she thought was her friend, uh, a man in her life who she considered a friend up until he raped her. And then she experienced a kidnapping um, and, a, and another sexual, and another rape, if you will. And so here's a person who has experienced a lot from molestation to rape. Um, and so we use the word sexual violence sometimes to kind of put it all together in a little package so that people will know that we're talking about everything because it can affect people in different ways, but sometimes it can affect them in the same way. A person who had an attempted sexual assault can have the very same traumatic experience as a person who was raped or as a person who was molested, and when I say molested, it's, it's touched inappropriately 
maybe not penetration, but touched uh, in the genital areas or other sexual areas of a child's body. Um, but the trauma effects can be exactly the same. So I'm glad that you brought up the question. The words can be used as synonyms. They can mean different things. It depends on state to state. But for the survivor, like they should be leading how they um, talk about their experience. If they use the word rape, use that word. If they use the word sexual assault, use that word. Um, because it is important to kind of put them at the center, put them at the forefront of these conversations um, if they're conversations to be had. One of the victims of Mr. Weinstein said that um, one of the issues that, that she raised was um, the way that people are conditioned to um, to sometimes please others or um, being re-triggered from from childhood trauma. So when when a, a forceful individual starts um, attacking them or um, assaults them, that they they kind of freeze and they, and they're not able to uh, get away from the situation. Uh, that is something that I really wanted to discuss with you because. For a lot of people, um, they start thinking like, well, how did the person end up in that situation? And, and what are the, the things that that make someone not um, react? Like, you know, they start talking about uh, the survival mode and, and fleeing, fighting. Uh, so what what is triggered within the brain that, that makes someone shut down or be in so much fear that, that they freeze and then the the other person uh, is able to uh, attack them and, and to to that extent. Yeah. Um, so in most of our lives, we've heard a lot of fight or flight. That you're either going to fly, you know, you're either going to flee, run away, or you're going to stay and fight. And we and we use those terms even outside of the context of trauma. But really, that's where they come from that there are, um, you know, that there, oh, it's just so much. There's a certain part of our brain that gets triggered when we, um, I'm sorry, let me start over. So we've heard the words uh, fight or flight to describe something that we might do when we feel like we're in danger. We've heard this over and over and even outside of the context of trauma. Uh, but within trauma, we have to think about that the brain is going to respond. It's a survival instinct. It's a survival mechanism that's actually in the brain to help us survive. So, for for example, um, you know, being chased by an older boy in the, in the neighborhood who you think is going to, um, you know, hurt you. You, you know, he may start chasing you and you start running for your life. Um, and there could be a, a wall that you have to jump over and you can jump clear over it, um, even though it might be as tall as you. Um, and so that was the flight response, giving the body an extra boost of energy that, that you needed in that emergency, because it is, it is an emergency to get to safety. Sometimes it's, you know, actually sticking around and, and fighting it out um, when you feel like you're in danger. But there is one response that works differently. And a lot of people have never heard of it. And it's actually called the freeze response. When we're overwhelmed by an attacker and we think that there is no hope of surviving, we tend to freeze. And so it's important to know that that is also um, that is also a response that have to do with the branches of our autonomic nervous system. They work in harmony with each other um, to deal with the threats that we face and then recover. And so, you know, this nervous system is a network of fibers that extends throughout the bodies, connect, throughout our body, connecting the brain with organs and muscle groups in order to coordinate the response that we're going to have. So it's not, and, and actually the thinking part of your brain, the logical part of your brain that makes decisions shuts down at that moment. So you're not even 
in charge of making the decision. Your brain is making the decision in that moment um, to get you out of the danger. So many, many times a person, when they feel like there's no hope, uh, I can't get out of this, the body tends to just shut down and freeze to get through it. And the reason that that might happen, I can't speak for the survivor in the Weinstein case because I'm not aware of that survivor, nor can I speak to the case itself. I'm not privy to all the information. I can definitely uh, say that there are survivors who's, who experienced that freeze response very early in childhood. That's the way that their brain just responded to it. And so throughout adulthood even, they will have the same response in many other situations. So it's, it's we really, really should know that telling a survivor something like, well, why didn't you just fight back? Why didn't you just say no? Number one, that's not helpful because it's blaming the victim again. Um, and, and leaving the perpetrator's actions outside of any kind of accountability for them doing something wrong, um, saying that the victim did something wrong is victim blaming. But then second, it, it really doesn't speak to that part of the brain that may not even let the person say no or run away or fight. Um, that person just froze. So I think, you know, it's absolutely right that these kinds of stories, again, bring up important topics of conversation for us to talk about so that people can have a better understanding of why it happened that way. And again, to have more compassion for the survivors and to believe them and to not question so much what their actions were at the time, but to really question the perpetrator's actions. I think that as a society, we wash our hands of the problem of violence against women and children and men by blaming the victim because it's so hard to hold the perpetrator accountable that we don't even want to try. It's almost unconscious that we put the blame on the victim because it's so hard to blame the perpetrator and hold you know, that person in power accountable. It's so much easier to just say, she must be lying, she must have done something to deserve it, than to say, hey, wait a minute, this guy did this thing that's terrible, and how can we get him to stop? Because the only person who can prevent sexual violence from happening is the perpetrator. But unfortunately, society just tends to kind of go with the myths that have been created by the perpetrator um, themselves to get us to look a different, to look another way. In a related question, um, May and Balik, the star of the hit TV show The Big Bang Theory and Blossom, uh, got in trouble for discussing how um, women's liberation does not mean that the culture has changed. She was accused of victim blaming, as she mentioned, the, the way women are exploited by their looks and the media um, kind of creates a, a, a culture of... of I guess she was saying that the people that the men feel entitled to them because they're, um, you know, they're they're portraying them in a, in a sexualized way uh, on the screen, and then they're surrounded by people, and so so that was kind of like a, a weird thing that she said. And then she was saying that um, that women need to have better boundaries, and that um, that you shouldn't meet with an executive in their in their apartment or their hotel room. So she she was saying that there are certain things that the people can do to avoid certain situations. Do do you think that that safety and discernment play a role in in preventing uh, sexual assault? I know that is that when that is brought up, then people can say, well, it can happen on any circumstance. It can happen, um, you know, it's usually by someone that you know, so it happens unexpectedly. But in in a field like uh, Hollywood or this uh, mass media con conglomerates, uh, a lot of it is very sexualized. So is there like a, a higher percentage of, of people um, being put in those uh, situations or, or 
people shouldn't even discuss those things regarding being more cautious and and not um, being caught up in that type of um, situation. I think it's definitely tricky because it's kind of like it's almost like a double-edged sword like you want you want not you necessarily but uh, people want let's say women in this case to be able to protect themselves and to able to re to be able to reduce the risk of a sexual assault happening So they say things like, well, women need to have better boundaries or you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that and you shouldn't go over here and you shouldn't be by yourself. But that's very tricky because, again, it can sound very victim blaming because when something does happen to that person, they're already going to be blaming themselves in many different ways. They're already going to be saying the same things. I should have done this. I could have done that. I shouldn't have done this. Um, and, and it keeps them from coming forward and getting help. Um, it keeps them from reporting incidents because they are, they feel like they're to blame and they feel like they're going to get judged and somebody's going to blame them. So in a sense, I do think that it can be very hurtful to say something like that. However, I do think that we should make a distinction between what we call prevention and what we call risk reduction. Can we reduce the risks of being in danger? Maybe, maybe a little bit, you know. Um, but we're we're always going to be in situation. We're always going to find in our in ourselves in situations that we don't want to be in. And again, it's it's just something that happens in life. So saying something like, "Well, they shouldn't be in an executive's office by themselves." If you're going somewhere for a job interview. That's pretty typical to be by yourself with the boss of that company. Um, or even if you already work there and your boss calls you to his office, you don't take your friend with you. Like it's pretty common practice to do that. So I think that, you know, that advice is not so helpful. Can we tell women, you know, take some self-defense classes, um, you know, uh, Walk, in, walk together in groups across campus. Yes, we can say that, but it doesn't mean that 100% of the time women will have control over that. So I'll give you an example that I've been thinking about all day, actually, and I thought about it in, in two different ways. But yesterday, um, I helped uh, my best friend move into his new house, and he needed to pick up his washer and dryer at the same time that the cable company was going to come out and put in his internet and so on and so forth. And he works from home over the computer, so he really needed that done. And he really needed to go pick up the washer and dryer that he had just purchased uh, from, you know, a used one. So he needed to go show up before they sold it to somebody else. So he said, would you mind staying here while the cable guy gets here? And I didn't even think about it. I was like, sure, you know, no problem. And he's like, I should be back by 4.30, what have you. And while, you know, the guy's doing his work, didn't think a thing of it. And then I'm thinking to myself, here's an example that I give to clients. The only reason I didn't get raped by this man, the cable man who's in the house with me by ourselves, is because he's not a rapist. So people who get raped have the bad luck of being around people who are rapists. So that's, again, putting the accountability back on the perpetrator and taking it away from the victim. Can we talk about risk reduction? Sure, let's talk about it. But the bigger picture is let's talk to usually men and boys who are the most common perpetrators of sexual assault. Let's talk to them about how it's not your right to touch somebody's genitals. It is not your right because you're their boss or because you're rich or because you're funny or, you know, whatever you think gives you the right, it is not okay. And let's talk to survivors about coming forward and going to places that are safe where people are not going to judge them. So to counseling centers, for example, that have rape crisis centers or to some police departments that have like very good detectives in their sex crimes unit. Because most people don't come forward thinking they're going to be judged, thinking they're not going to be believed, thinking that they're going to be blamed because they're already blaming themselves. 
so it is really Im important to be careful and not give victim blaming messages because that's going to keep the cycle also going of people not coming forward. So this actress that you mentioned, you know, again, I haven't heard her commentary, but just based on what you said, it just doesn't seem like the most helpful commentary. A movie director, Kevin Smith, uh, speaks of uh, Harvey Weinstein as like a father figure. Um, and, you know, there was the, the case with Bill Cosby. And a lot of people um, wonder, like, why are these powerful men who usually they can use their their fame and their and their power just to um to seduce seduce people or to be with as many people as they want why do they become aggressive and, and assaulting like is it part of the the manipulative uh, mentality that that there comes to a point where they think they can get away with anything like i know there was a case of uh a congressman who was texting some of his um, uh, assistants um, dirty pictures, and and it was like, what I was thinking is like, does he think that that he's so powerful that nobody's gonna report him? Is there something that that clicks? On, on, has there been any studies or anything where some of these people think that they're like superhuman and that that everything is is at their disposal, and or have they been Condition to to not value the worth of, of other people and, and just take what they want. Uh, w what has been the the conversation regarding um, the type of personalities that, that lead people to do this type of abuse? Yeah, I definitely think you know it's it's important to talk about maybe three causes of sexual violence for for perpetrators. One is, you know, is it possible that something's, you know, wrong with that person? Yes, there can be some kind of pathology to the offender. Yes, um, you know, it could possibly be a sociopath or a psychopath. But those are not the majority of cases. The majority of cases are related to our culture that in some way supports or condones, um, you know, those condones. Uh, violent messages and violent sexual behavior. And so some people will throw around the term rape culture to talk about how, um, again, women and children are, you know, they get, ex we see exploitative messages about them that we begin to see people as objects instead of as human beings, that the status of, status of women in our, of women and children in our culture is lower than men um, I think that for powerful people, it's the assumption of, of other people, whether, you know, again, mostly women, but some men are just available to them sexually. They've gotten this message. They have, they, they have a sense of entitlement. And so that's also an example of rape culture. So, you know, it could be the individual pathology of the offender. It could be that they were brought up in a society that tells them it's okay that they get what they want by any means that they want to get it. I also have to say that rape is not violent sex. So when a, when a, when a powerful person wants sex, they can get sex from a number of consensual people. It's not very difficult to, to have consensual sex. You can even buy sex. But rape is actual, is just, it's violence that's sexualized. So they are looking for that feeling of power and control um, and with the assumption that they are entitled to always have power and control even when a victim says, no, I don't want this. Um, so that's another reason, you know, that could cause the sexual violence in these types of cases to happen. So it's impossible to agree on a single source for the cause of sexual violence, but it's such a multidimensional issue that requires, you know, responses on all fronts. It needs to be researched more. It needs to be talked about with survivors. You know, we need to learn more about these possible
pathologies, if you will. So it's just, it's very, very, um, again, it's very useful to just talk about, you know, what could be the causes, what is making, what is driving men to do this. And it's the same with men who don't have like a high status in our society. So, so, you know, laymen, if you will, um, not just famous men also could be experiencing pathology uh, or just being brought up in a rape culture. So it's the same reasons, uh, power and control or some kind of mental disorder or illness, which again, those are the least amount of cases. Um, it's mostly this sense of uh, objectifying other people, turning them into objects for our use, or also just the assumption that they're entitled to the sexuality of women at any time. Well, and thank you for that definition. I think for me it's been the most helpful because when when I went through the training in your organization and they and someone mentioned that the rape wasn't about sex, it was about power, I was or control. They said it's, it's not about sex, it's about control. And I'm like, there's a lot of ways you can control someone. There's there's a lot of ways you can even um, victimize or uh, buy like hold someone in bondage. But why does it have to be in in a sexual way? So when you say that it's sexualized violence, that makes a lot of sense. Is that it's this idea that um, of of at attacking the person and hurting them in the more intimate way, and, and Yes, it's probably the most humiliating, um, despicable way that anyone can be hurt other than homicide. I mean, it's right there next to homicide. So the worst, you know, a physical assault is horrible. Emotional abuse is horrible, absolutely. But you're upping the ante at least one more step when it's sexual violence. So you're right. Well, something that stayed with me uh, was during the Michael Jackson controversy or, or accusations, uh, one of his best friends, Corey Feldman, was interviewed, and he said that he had never experienced any type of um, even hints of abuse from Michael Jackson, but that he had been abused by different producers, directors, and agents from, from Hollywood, and he even gave the names of all the people to the police in Hollywood and he was frustrated that they didn't do anything with the information. So I wonder, part of the rape culture, is that maybe one of the reasons that is not prosecuted or pursued by other men in power, now we're talking about the authorities, is because it um, it kind of eats up at, at their sense of control and their sense of power. I'm, I'm not accusing all... Um, um, people who, who work in the in the criminal field and stuff like that. I'm not accusing the authorities of of all partaking of that. But there is a sense of of men um being scared that once everything's out in the open that everybody's uh, sins are gonna be held uh, into account. So maybe there's like a good old boy network of, of kinda men protecting men or men dismissing um accusations towards men because they don't want to look at themselves and their own issues with violence and, and inappropriate sexual behavior. Yeah, I think this is this is like a very deep conversation about you know what we consider the patriarchy. And many times I do say men, and I am not saying that women cannot sexually abuse men. Um, I've I've heard on the media lots of cases of um, adult women sexually abusing, you know, children. I've heard um, in my own cases here at the Women's Center, some women sexually abusing girls. Um, but we do, here at the Women's Center, we do look at the big picture of society and societal values. And again, going with this word patriarchy, it's this, again, how our culture, how... People in power in our culture tend to want to maintain their power 
and sometimes use oppressive um, tactics to do it. So whether it's, um, you know, men's power over women and children or adults' power over children or rich people's power over people who are not as rich or who are poor, um, so on and so forth. And so that that shows up in any system, including the criminal justice system. So if you have uh, police officers who are not trained and who don't believe um, or who don't even push that investigation forward, um, who, you know, it's the one crime where the, where the victim has to, she has the burden of proof in many ways, um, when in other cases you wouldn't get asked the same questions. Um, like if I were to say, hey, you know, somebody broke into my car and took it, people wouldn't ask me, well, what were you doing there to begin with? You know, or, you know, what does your car look like? Well, you should know that red cars, you know, but with sexual assault, we start asking these crazy questions like, what were you wearing and what time was it? And, and what were you doing there? And were you drinking? Um, because, again, it's a way to put the blame on the victim and to wash our hands of it and say, well, I'm not going to let this go in any more first, you know, any further. We've heard cases of police officers who are the rapists police officers who have sexually assaulted um, people that are in custody or have told them, if you have sex with me, I will not arrest you. And then, you know, fortunately, uh, the women, you know, some women have come forward and then the video, there will be video somewhere that shows that it happened. So, you know, police officers are part of our are part of our society. Yes, they can be just as patriarchal. Yes, they can watch each other's, you know, they can watch each other's backs. Again, I'm not saying every police officer. I've worked with some really good police officers here in Houston, but I've also heard my clients have like a woman police officer ask them crazy questions or not believe them. Um, one of my clients uh, told me that when she went to make the police report uh, about a, a a guy who she thought was a friend who sexually assaulted her, the police officer who was a woman in this case said, um, well, are you sure that you didn't just have sex with him and you didn't like it? Um, so now you're calling it a rape. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't even make any sense, <laughs> but that's what she said to her. And so again, yes, what can keep people from coming forward is w the stories that they hear of not being believed at the, you know, by police officers. I have clients who don't get calls back from detectives. And so we have, you know, we have to make the calls on their behalfs because it's harder to ignore a professional who works in the rape crisis center than it is to ignore a victim who's called you, you know, five times and you're not returning their call. We know the protocol. We can call their supervisor and say, hey, what's going on with detective so-and-so not calling, you know, such and such client back. Um, so there's, unfortunately, everywhere in our society, we need to look at where that inequality um, is happening and where it may be hurtful to survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence, for that matter. One of the most shocking reports that I saw after this, uh, this current case of, of the movie Mogul was... Um, you know, Winnet Paltrow mentioned that she had been uh, harassed by him in one of the um, op-ed pieces of Fox News uh, came after her and saying, well, if you were harassed uh, 30 years ago and you didn't do anything about it and you haven't told anybody about it until now, uh, how dare you uh, even complain? And it was this idea that, um, that since she's a powerful woman in Hollywood, that she should be um, working against uh, sexual assault and harassment and that she should have been um, helping people not fall prey of, of this man. Uh, but then the Reese Witherspoon came out uh, today saying that she was attacked when she was 16 and that she feels a lot of shame for not speaking out earlier. So do you think that, um, that that has a lot to do with it? Not only is it a field that is very... Um, difficult to to stand up for yourself because it's all about power and money and and stuff like that but 
It's also the the idea of can you really police or um, stand up? Like up until now, there's been that dismissive culture where if someone were to say something, they would say, oh, well, you were the one that brought it by yourself. But then this idea that now the victims are to blame for not informing other victims and not stopping this man. Um, so it just seems like this very like quick reaction to start judging everybody for not speaking about it when it is a very hurtful thing to even um, discuss with your friends and family. So to make it public is, is a lot of scrutiny that you're going to be under. Yeah, I think um, I think that that's exactly right. And to me, it just falls. And people who are hearing this on the radio is like, there she goes again. It's part of victim blaming. You know, why is, why is, you know, why, why would we hold another victim responsible for the perpetrator's behavior? <sighs> Most survivors that I talk to, when they come here, many, 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 many of them, the first thing they say is, I'm here because I want to forget about it and I'm having trouble forgetting about it. And that's the number one goal that many survivors say is they they want to put it behind them. They want to put them. They want to get past it. They want to get. So these are some of the words that they use. And so to me, it makes complete sense for someone to wait thirty years or fifteen years or however long it is to tell because one, they're already feeling um, like they want to get past it. They want to forget about it. They want to move on. Two, you know, they think that they're alone. Like, what if I come forward and nobody believes me? You know, again, usually the person who's the victim does not have a lot of power. And so even if a person, you know, a person who's now 40, 45 was victimized 30 years ago, she was 15 at the time, you know? So we have to really take that into account. And again, not say that she's to blame, that she could have prevented it from happening. The only person who can prevent sexual assault is the person who's thinking about sexually assaulting someone. So the perpetrators. We have to get that in our minds. Until we get past victim blaming, we're not going to be able to prevent any sexual assault from happening. We cannot blame the victims ever, ever, ever. Because that isn't going to change society. What changes society is men speaking to other men about sexual assault um, and making safe spaces for survivors to come forward, taking them seriously, believing them, not judging them, not blaming them, um, and again, holding the perpetrator accountable, whether that means like as a community, as a family, or in the criminal justice system. Holding perpetrators accountable um, can prevent them from doing it again. Well, well, in the last few minutes, let's talk about that. Is there programs for men? Because um, it's just um, one of my friends wants to try to start a, a ministry or a program to help Johns, like men that go to strip clubs or to um, participate in, in, in prostitution. And, and it was kind of like almost impossible to get it off the ground. So I know that... Um, you know, there's people who have done videos that, they, that you can show kids at schools or something like that. But is there like any major movement where um, men talk honestly about um, the objectification of women and the entitlement and things like that? Or is it mostly, um, you know, sorry to say, like wishful thinking that, that one day uh, that can actually be uh, addressed because it's, there's so much denial about it? Yeah, no, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think it's so important to make it safe spaces for men who are not violent to be able to talk about these issues and to be able to learn how to talk to other men and young boys, you know, high school students, middle school students, about violence in the world, including bullying, sexual harassment, date rape, so on and so forth. So there are organizations across the country who do different kinds of work 
I would encourage your friend to talk to somebody at an organization called Men Against Violence. Uh, Men Against Violence Against Women. Um, it's it's the acronym is M A V A W dot org. So it's a volunteer based organization founded by men who seek to end gender violence and sexism. And then so there's another organization. Um, called menstoppingviolence.org and again it's a, it's a, a training group they have programs they do advocacy um, to end male violence against women and girls and there is a wonderful writer and advocate named Paul Kivel K I V E L and he's out of California. I heard him speak a couple of years ago, but I've worked, I've used his work for many, many years um, because he um, is one of the pioneers in, in that movement of working with boys and men to end violence against uh, women and girls and talking about other forms of oppression like racism and homophobia. So yes, it's possible. Um, just maybe look, needing to look at other models um, to have these conversations. And even if it's like a group of four that meets in the beginning, you know, that's, to me, that's already a success. And then if those four people can convince, you know, two more people to come in to the, to the group. So it's um, starting small and moving up from there. And just the last thing, and it's kind of controversial, but, um, the current president uh, had allegations against him. There's uh, there's one that is in the forefront right now from one of the contestants of The Apprentice, and um, and then you know he blew it off as you know uh, people lying and trying to mess up his reputation. But um, it seems like there's a backlash from you know sensitivity training and and being. Uh, understanding of people from different cultures or sexual identities like there's a backlash of more traditionalist kind of like men are in charge women sh should be subservient uh, powerful men get to do whatever they want uh, like there's this idea that like somehow liberalism or I don't know even you call it like empathic society is too um, too mushy and too oversensitive and now there's this um desire to be go back to the good old days where men are tough and women stay home and stuff like that so do you see like a resurface of of some of these problems and now like the culture is even um like taking the steps back because of what's happening in the political and social world or are the strides that were made in the past few years are actually moving forward or is it kind of stagnant at this time because of what's going on? Ooh, that's a good question. I think, let me see, what do I think about this? Uh, I honestly think that, that the political climate that we live in has made it a safe space for people who have been thinking this for a long time to come forward. I don't think it's a new thing. I think um, it's giving a voice to people who have been living in the shadows, so to speak. So what I can compare it to is giving a voice to white supremacists, for example. Um, it's okay to come out and say, you know, I believe uh, white people are better than everybody else. I think those people have been around. We just didn't hear it because it wasn't well received. Um, so I think that, yes, we're hearing more about this traditional uh, way of life being the fix for everything, but it's been there. I think the religious right worked really hard in the 80s and 90s and 2000s to give credence to this belief that, you know, men have a place and women have a place and that's how it should be and they've been working hard you know, for 40 years to get us to where we are now, where people do believe that, that, you know, if we just go back to the good old days, quote unquote, because we've forgotten how bad the old days were, um, because we've had it so good for the past, you know, 
how many every years you want to call it, like when would that women have been have made strides in society, um, become you know gone into the workforce, become elected officials, that we had a woman, you know, run for the presidency. Um, but then people seem to forget that it took a lot of hard work to get where we are. And wanting things to go back is definitely not a good idea. Um, and so I, I guess the last thing I'd like to say about that is that people who believe in feminism uh, and who really understand what that means know that it's the eradication of the oppression of any person. You know, feminism is not to make, not just to make women equal to men. And by equal, we don't mean physically equal. We mean socially, politically, um, and economically equal. Um, we also believe that we have to do that along racial lines. We need to do that across economic lines. We need to do that. Um, across the world, it's not just about the United States, uh, but there. But again, there's been a backlash for 40 years about what feminism means, and looking at it from it's what's destroying our society. When really, in my opinion, feminism is what has made things better in our society. Well, we want to thank you for your time. Uh, ho uh, hopefully. Um things get better and, and we, we won't need you to come back on the show, but um, we always um, we always have people come back on the show because of what's going on. Uh, so we, um, we think it's very important for people to become informed of um, these type of issues. It is difficult to discuss it. And I also want to uh, say that we try to be as sensitive uh, as we can with people who have experienced the type of abuse. But like you said, it's, it's rewarding to know that um, talking about it gives people hope and it gives them the ability to feel um, that that it is being addressed and that there are people who care. So I want to thank you for your work in the in the community of Houston, and we'll have a link on our on our um, website uh, for resources in the Nashville area as well. So thank you, Ms. Manzano, and um, I know you work with uh, nationally. You guys go to conferences and stuff like that, so. There's a lot of resources all over the country, right? There are, and there's also a National Sexual Assault Hotline. So I would love for you to put that link there too in case you know people are listening to you online somewhere else. There's a National Sexual Assault Hotline to connect you to the Rape Crisis Center in your area. 1-800-656-4673. 1-800-656-4673. And it's available 24 hours every day. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for the work you're doing too. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We will be back next week with another episode of The Mystic and the Skeptic. Show descriptions and content are available online on our Facebook page. We would like to thank Radio Free Nashville for their technical guidance and assistance. The songs you hear on our introduction and finale are from the band The Ancient Gnostics. The first one is called Day by Day, produced by Hafki. The second one is called All Mine, and it's produced by Brotherhood. I know I ain't been here for a long time. Doing better on my own now, it's my time. It's what I chose, it's what I own, it's my life. Last time I checked and looked it up, it's all mine. I know I ain't been here for a long time. Doing better on my own now, it's my time. It's what I chose, it's what I own, it's my life. Last time I checked and looked it up, it's all mine. I'm on line, I'm on track, I'm just fine. I may find when I look back, it's all mine. See the choice is yours to unlock the force Telekinesis That Christ consciousness is always constant We are Jesus 
But we're born in a world torn into fragments and pieces. More tragedy in its reality. Magic reality. Magic reality. Magic reality. Magic reality. Magic reality. Magic reality.